So, uh, so the promise to uh, continue <coughs> uh, where we ended uh, up uh, yesterday. Um, just to remind you, we were calculating the within the replica method the partition function, the replicated partition function v to the n, and we got. Uh, Don't like this integral, then I leave for my opportunity to plus infinity and uh, put this close of two pi here. That doesn't matter. Uh, it's a bit of Gaussian, but as I again it's a factor, it doesn't matter. Um, then there were um, there were a few terms. Uh, there were some factor which. Uh, uh, was just a factor uh, e to the e to the n beta square j square over four. It's just a three factor. Then there were the Gaussian measure on the q, which was uh, minus n j square beta square over two times alpha. And then we have a trace. Then we have here a trace over. Then we have a power to the n of a trace of a single side, but n, but n little n replica, with the Hamiltonian e to the beta square j square. Single side uh, would be <coughs> would be good to introduce this. So instead of uh, I'm just erasing, instead of writing it this way, I'm erasing this. I'm adding to the here. I'm adding something which is in the exponent, which would be kind of free energy. So I like it as minus n times uh, little n times beta. The single side effective Hamiltonian coupling the different replicas on one side, then trace on all degrees of freedom is a partition function, and the log of it is a free energy, but I'm writing it like this because I'm already want to pick up the physical free energy which would have little n. But right now we can think about it as something which I call it. At the end, this would be this whole thing would be proportional to little n, and therefore uh, I'll pick up the, the coefficient. But right now we can think about it this way. Okay, so okay, that's good. So um, now, how do I go about solving this problem? So 
the, the problem is that um, <coughs> this, is not, although it is a single site, but it is still a kind of a weird Ising model, coupling different Ising streams on this side, and the coupling is arbitrary because I, I cannot assume any signature of the coupling because I have to look at the unit of all possible couplings. So there's no point of saying, well, maybe Q alpha beta has this nice. the limit n goes to infinity, right, because in this limit, we don't really have to do the integral, because the integral is dominated by the cell form. Okay. So we can, I don't know, I don't want to introduce some details about that, but this is not a good notation. Let me so let me put this just forget about this integral and we say that g equals to this and uh, <coughs> and q is computed by d f d q alpha beta equal to zero. Okay. So that's the settle point. That's the settle point. Settle point approximation. But I want to emphasize that it is an approximation, it's not exact as long as n, capital N is fine. In the limit of n goes to infinity, this asymptotically will be, uh, will be, will be exact. In other words, I can replace g instead of by integrating over q by replacing q by, not by integral, by the set point, which I write as u0. down what these equations are, how these equations look like, whether they make sense, okay? So let's do this, this, uh, this derivative. So we'll have here, I'm sorry, this case, we'll have here Q alpha beta cells, so this will give us Q alpha beta times this, and, and then what else do we have? We have this. This will give us 1 over Z, and from the Z, 
we'll get, by, when we integrate pure of beta, we get SI alpha SI beta. So it's kind of easy to see that we get pure alpha beta in trace over Right, because remember, pure alpha beta is this is simply the average of the, the product SI SI on two replicas, and with the weight which has to do with the Hamiltonian of the uh, of the uh, of the string and then normalization by Pn. So that that equations which uh, again make sense and are exact and so far. There is Solve the problem. If you know, if you know how to solve this, these are the equations, and we know. So we put it back into the free energy, which is Q. If you can solve them, and we are back. And then what we have to do is to take the n goes to zero limit of, of this solution, and we are done. So far, I don't, I don't touch the n goes to zero limit. Okay. <coughs> so we cannot do that, right? Because these are. Important assumption is replica symmetry or symmetric or replica symmetry angle. Okay? Question? Yeah. Why can't you do this integration without the uh, So I have numbers. I have 1.5, 3 point something. The assumption that I'm, I want to make is about uh, about the structure of pure alpha beta, about a, a, a symmetry. So, what, what, so let's first think about symmetry. So this is the integral of all pure alpha beta, but f of pure alpha beta I claim has symmetries in it. Okay, the f itself has symmetries in it. Why? Because if I uh, if I commute the indices alpha beta, this part doesn't care because it's sum of the odd pairs. And this part, again, uh, you know, it, it, this is definitely doesn't care about relabeling alpha beta. So the whole thing I can, I can just uh, uh, definitely permute and, uh, and nothing will happen. And, and obviously so, because we, we introduced identical replicas, so there is no way that one is different from three and so on. So F has this symmetry. If you want z to the n, no, z to the n is after integration. I'm talking about fn uh, is invariant under. 
the fermentation of the endosomes, of the epithelial endosomes. Okay? This is not an assumption. This is a, this is a fact. It's an absolute from the structure. Now, the fact that F has this, this uh, invariant does not necessarily mean that its saddle points have this has this. It does mean that there is a saddle point with this invariant. But it but but it doesn't mean that that there are not saddle points which break this invariant. As in all phase transitions and symmetry breakings, there is a symmetry in the system, but the saddle point, the actual solution, uh, will break the symmetry, will have a symmetry potential both in symmetry with the magnetization pointing up and, and another statement with each pointing up down, but each one of them breaks the symmetry of the up down. So we are going to assume that this symmetry is not broken. That's the assumption. So the assumption, the metric asymmetric answer is that this shadow point here is, is such that there is no, that all the indices are the same. Okay? And and by the way, the fact that there is such a solution is again comes out of the properties of the symmetry. Comes in, comes in here. But it, but it doesn't mean that there aren't other symmetries. Okay? So we are going to make the assumption there are F solutions that the cell that the relevant cell point is the one which is itself invariant. Invariant, which means that it is what's called the replica, the, rep, the RS solution. We are going to look at this solution. Now, what does it mean that it's invariant? Basically, it means that pre alpha beta is constant, right? That there is no difference between different pairs. So, this means that we're going to assume that pre alpha beta has the structure of, well, we didn't define it in the diagonal, so we'll take the diagonal zero. And then there is some Q in both diagonals. That's it. That's our answer. So now we, we reduce the whole problem to calculating this Q. Okay. Once we make this assumption, then the calculation then it's kind of straightforward. There is a, a, the algebra is very simple. So let's, for instance, look at at what this is the, the first time. So with this assumption, we look at sum over alpha less than beta of q alpha beta square and it's, it's convenient as here to, to define it in, in a symmetric fashion not only in the upper diagonal so this one I, I, I just write as one half times of the overall alpha less than beta of q alpha beta square and this will be uh, then uh, one half times n times n minus one over, uh, yeah, it's all the pairs times Q squared. <coughs> okay. And what about, so this is, this is one term. What about, what about the Hamiltonian, the single site Hamiltonian, this one? Let's look at this. So we have now, so this is one, one object. The other object is sum over alpha less than beta of Q alpha beta SI alpha SI beta in, the, in this uh, single site Hamiltonian. Again, I'm writing it as one half times of sum over alpha less than beta, and I put out Q of SI alpha SI beta. And now it's it, it's convenient to add to add uh, the alpha equal to beta to complete the square. And then to subtract the alpha equal to beta, which is just n. <coughs> okay, so these are the two terms which we have to we have to work. So the first term is the simple, we just put it here. But the Hamiltonian now we have to deal with the Hamiltonian. So now we have the Hamiltonian with this kind of interaction. It's kind of all to all interaction, but still we have the square. So it's some square, but we already know what to do with some square. The Hubbard Cantonovitz transformation, the Gaussian transformation. So 
we are going to introduce in, in, to do, in order to do this to do this trade. Now we have here Si sum of Si squared. We're going to introduce a single Gaussian variable, just a single because you know we just have one sum squared. So then we, we can we can say that e to the j square beta square over q over two sum over alpha from one to n of h i alpha square. This business we can write down as the integral of the Gaussian variable, we call it x, from zero from minus infinity to plus infinity, e to the minus x square over two, and here we'll have plus j square plus j times beta times square root of q times sum over alpha from one to n of s i alpha times times uh, this x. Well, I can put it uh, e to <coughs> And now I can do the trick because I can I can change the order of the integral and uh, the integral and the uh, and the trace of over z this trace here okay and now I can do it so now we'll have here um, I put the trace inside so we'll have g n is Gaussian integral I'll introduce Gaussian integral by this by this uh, notation capital integral dx, and if I don't write it, it means from minus infinity to plus infinity, it means dx from minus infinity to plus infinity with the proper Gaussian measure, with, with this norm one, okay? So this will be dx, okay, so I'll just write, okay? And now I have trace over s i alpha of e to the beta square j, no, e to the beta j square root of q times sum over alpha from one to n s i alpha. Okay, but now it's a product of uncoupled times x. Now it's a product of uncoupled recitals, so I can do the trace of each one of them and and pay to the power n. So what I get is dx. Each trace is just a single iv. So it's e to the plus plus e to the minus. So it's just two cosh. So I get two cosh of beta j square root of q times x, all this to the power n. <coughs> Good. Product of, of trace of, of traces of the Gaussian
because I have to collect it, and this will be, you can check the term, this will be minus beta square j square over, no, uh, yeah, over 2 times q. <coughs> so these are the constant terms, and then the log z. <coughs> but now these are the n plus dx of log of 2 cos beta j square over q times n. So this, so this, so this we are done. We have the free energy and we have the order parameter. This, uh, this is the free energy, this is order parameter. So we finish, we solve the problem. This is plain easy. But in the large n limit, this is the solution. Okay, now what is the physical meaning of the solution before we go on? The physical meaning of the solution is, is, is very simple. Now, Q, remember, is SI, the physical meaning of Q. So I can replace all this. tangent of a local field, which I can write as h, which, uh, let's say, h of x, I can write it as hi, and hi is beta j times, or beta hi, better, beta hi, and, and beta h, and hi is j times square root of q, times random Gaussian variable xi. And the average over sites or the average over the j's is simply averaging over the Gaussian variable x, <coughs> which is this. So that's the prediction of the theory. The prediction of the theory is that if you look at the system, basically you can think about them as uncoupled, but each one of them has a random field. Different spins will have different realization of this random field. And if you take one spin and average, thermal average, then you get hyperbolic tangent. And if you average over j, then you have to square it, so you get hyperbolic tangent squared, and then do the Gaussian average. And if you do spatial average, or given realization, or quench, or, or quench average, it will be the same story. You will get this theory. <coughs> That's the physical. Gaussian dynamical variable. It's a Gaussian quench variable. Think about the spin has temperature, think about the spin as uncoupled and has a temperature T and a static field HI. So what will be the thermal average? I put tangent beta HI. This is a quench Gaussian variable. Okay? It's not a thermal variable. It's after doing the average. So this is just a quench fixed static HI in noise, te thermal noise, T. So, you know, one, take one spin in a field HI, the temperature T, the average, the thermal average will be hyperbolic tangent, beta HI. That's the thermal average, gives you this. And now the quenched average gives you this. <coughs> okay? More questions? Okay, now why this should be the the width of the Gaussian variable. Well, it's not so difficult to think about it. So what would be the naive HI? The naive HI 
So we have to think about it. It will be sum over j of j i j s j. Now if I do average, I can think about it as kind of sum over a naive mean field will say, well, why don't you take h i to be just this one? And if I just now think about this as random and Gaussian, and the variance of this will be an x query. So, you know, the variance, I take the square of this, and I take only the, only the, the, the diagonal terms because the cancellation. So I get kind of j i j squared sum over j, s j squared, if I keep only the, the diagonal you know, the equal j and the prime terms. And this one will give me j squared, this one will give me q. So the standard deviation is j times square root of q. So this is kind of j squared times q. Of course, there is one over n, but there is summation, so altogether it will be j squared q. So we could have written this. We just could say, well, mean field, you know, a big correlation. So we just replace si, sj by the other j and uh, and then this is the average is zero and the square and so on. The answer is this is wrong. This argumentation is wrong and we'll come to it later. The result looks looks this, okay? But the but the argumentation is wrong and the reason why this is the right result is because there are cancellation of two wrong uh, wrong things which leads to the right result. But 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 the argument is wrong. But it's it's a good start. No, if you if you just if somebody wakes you in the middle of the night and tells you, you know, what what will be, uh, well, you should be right. But then what can I, what else can it be? You know, that's a very simple intuitive argument. Yeah. Okay, <coughs> it's wrong because of correlations and so on. So I can just give you a hint. The the the, the replacement of the square of this by this is wrong because there are correlations between the sj and the jij. I cannot just replace this by j square and this by q and so on. There are correlations. So this one is wrong. Okay? The second reason is, that so this one error. The second error is that this, replacing hi by this, is itself wrong. You have to, this is, this is not, the, we have corrections to this. And these two sources of errors turns out to cancel each other. One error is assuming the H I assume that I can write H I as this. The other error is assuming that the statistics of this H I, this quantity, is just J squared times Q. Miraculously, these two errors cancel each other. Okay. I, I, th there is a literature on that I don't want to I cannot I, I want to, but I don't have time to spend on this. But this is this is the one of those miracles. Which confused everybody in the field at the time. Right, wrong, one, and so on. But it turns out that in this case, uh, there is this lack of two errors which cancel each other. Okay, good. So, uh, so now let's go back and solve it. So we have, what does it mean solve? We have basically we have to compute Q. Okay, so let's let's uh, let's now uh, analyze the solution. Now that we understand the physical meaning of this, so let's analyze the solution. Okay, so that's, so what we have? We have Q equals to Gaussian integral of uh, hyperbolic tangent square beta j square root of Qx, the Gaussian square. Okay, so this is a self-consistent equation And this is as in as in C theory or Newtonian C theory, you have the self-consistent equation for the order parameter Q to solve. Okay, another point. Q equal to zero is always a solution. All temperature. I put Q here, I get Q there. At all temperature. Okay. Now why is this so? Whatever j is, si, sj, if I sweep all these things, I, I 
get the same, I get uh, the same energy, and therefore the symmetry means that there is always a solution which has that symmetry. But if the solution has a symmetry, this other is before square root zero. That we call it abduct symmetry. There is no external field, then there is a solution like that. Okay, but it turns out that there is another solution for p below j. Less than j, there is another solution. There is also a solution for q uh, bigger than zero. So there is a, there is a non-trivial solution for q bigger than zero. And now to, to compute it, you have to kind of do numerics. Uh, you can expand here t, t equal j. You can expand here t equal to zero and compute the, the details, but I, I won't uh, go into this. I can just say that, you know, this is Pg, then above Pg, necessarily the only solution is zero, and below Pg there is some, some solution. It goes to one at zero temperature. You can see it from the equation, because this is, uh, this is just basically one. If Q is not zero and, and, and beta is infinity, it's just one, so Q is one. As long as q is not zero, it must be one. So it goes to, as p goes to zero, q goes to one. As p goes to pg, q goes to zero continuously. There's kind of a second order phase transition, and above it it is zero. So that's a prediction of what the edwards anderson order parameter should look like as a function of temperature, provided that the zero is not is not is not a relevant solution. Now we have to argue for it, and uh, argument is. Stability. I will not go into stability, but this solution here is stable. This solution is stable only for p bigger than pg. So this is why you don't take this here. It's unstable. Now we have to do the stability analysis carefully, and we will come to the stability in a few minutes. But that's uh, one thing. But that's that's. Uh, Imagine you start from Q equal to zero and you add a little bit of Q and compute the free energy, uh, compute the, this uh, integral, the seven point integral, and look whether the seven point is still kosher or not. And it turns out that when, when, when P is less than this is PG, PG plus J, this is J, simply J, uh, it turns out that uh, below this, uh, this solution. If you look at the free energy, okay, so this is temperature, and this is the free energy. The free energy coming out of this. We can, and this is our Pg, which is J. Free energy is kind of negative, but it's uh, it's um, yeah, it's uh, decreasing. two branches. So here, up to here, is just Q equal to zero. Okay? Here, there are two branches because there are two solutions. We can put Q equal to zero and compute Q to Q. Now, which one is which? Well, it turns out, in, in, in normal systems, you say, well, if there are two branches, you should choose the one with the lowest free energy. Well, not here. This is Q equal to zero, and this is Q bigger than zero. So it's not simply a free energy thing. Why? But nevertheless, if you look at the seven point, you have this integral, and you say, well, you know, a seven point has to be, a kosher seven point has to be a maximum of the integral, not, not a minimum, then, uh, then you, you end up choosing this, choosing this. And this, again, has to do with the fact that how many fluctuations we have with n times n minus 1 fluctuation around the seven point, right? You have a matrix. You have integrals of a matrix. The matrix has basically n times n minus 1 over 2 degrees of freedom, okay? So you can see that what 
happens is that if something is the coefficient of that, so we have integrals. Let's say we have something like n times n minus 1, and let's say we take a longitudinal fluctuation. So we now we turn on delta q. So we have uh, delta q squared. We'll have this term in our, in our, this term beta j in our exponential thing with some coefficient, positive coefficient. But that's the point. The point is that, that um, naively you would say, well, a has to be negative for stability. But because n goes to zero, the sign changes, then it ends up pe uh, picking the maximum of the free energy other than the minimum. So that's, that's the point. So you have to be careful not to just look at the free energy and choose the lower one. You have to go back to the integrals and do the analysis of the stable correctly. That's, again, one of the things that the whole field was anguish and agonizing about it. But unfortunately, already noticed this, because they had a way to compute Q basically something like this, and the free energy associated with it, and this, and this some mid-field approximation, and they discovered that that is the case, and we knew that you have to have a phase transition, so something, we need out of the replica, so we have other arguments, but I won't go into it, but anyway, that's, that's what happened. So it's a, one of those weird aspects of the, of the, of the field, it's still like that, but it's not the only one, at the beginning of the real thing, okay? So if you do the, the careful mathematical stable point analysis, you find that below this you have to choose the the max the, the, the large free energy branch rather than the low free energy branch. Okay, good. So now we can say there is a phase transition, a spin like phase transition, the first time we can say we there is a, a model, an infinite range model, has a power magnetic phase, has a spin glass phase. <coughs> there is no long range order, but there is this quench, uh, freezing into quench field, and the field has this uh, variance J squared times Q. Q is self consistently computed by the, by the order parameter, but by the, by the equation to give rise to this thing. Now, you can translate this to chi, remember chi is beta times 1 minus q, so you will have cusp here, etc., etc. So uh, you can uh, compute many things. You can compute, for instance, the, the specific heat, which is two derivatives with respect to temperature, and you will see weak singularity, not something dramatic. Uh, but the most important one will be, will be the, will be the, as I said, susceptibility, which we know that it should be 1 minus q, so there is a cusp in the susceptibility. So again, from the theory, you can chi 1 over t times 1 minus q, or q over Anderson, which is our q, will behave again as s will be zero, q0. Zero. So above pg, above j, it will just be like 1 over t, and then sj chi, and here it will because of the non-zero of Q, because of the appearance of Q. You can always, I won't go into it, but you can also compute, you can add a field, a uniform field, and then you'll have magnetization, and then you can compute from the theory M of external field and H, and you can start with the derivatives. If you take the first derivative, you just make half of this, nothing new. But you can expand to the cubic order, so you'll get this chi times h, and now there will be a minus uh, 1 over times some nonlinear times h cubed. I don't remember the factor, but it doesn't matter. The coefficient plus h cubed. So you can do it from this theory and compute the, this third derivative with respect to h. Okay? I, didn't, I didn't bring h here, but it's easy, you can easily do it. And then you compute this chi nonlinear, which is, you know, also called chi spin glass, as we discussed in the past, and you will find that this is 1 over t squared <coughs> minus j squared for t above j, and something else for t below it. But that's important. Now we see a general divergence. The nonlinear, this is up to some constant, this kind of linear is 
is the same in this prime prima up to some additive constant. So basically, we see here that the spindle susceptibility diverges. L, T, G, and J diverges. Okay? And as I discussed in the past, this chi spindle is related to sum over IJ of SI, SJ average squared divided by N and T. And the fact that it diverges means that there are correlations which become stronger and stronger as we approach the transition. This is this quantity. So correlation, why correlation? Because the average, the average is zero if I don't, the average um, as I as J without squaring is not zero, it's just something uh, average, but it is weak. But uh, if I don't square it, I'll get nothing. But after squaring, I reveal the fact, I unmask the fact that the correlations become stronger and stronger. But, but remember, without squaring, if I just look at the same much correlation, some of them will be positive and equal, of, you know, equal will be positive and negative. This one has to square it. Without squaring it, I just get a diagonal. I just get Q squared, nothing, nothing, nothing else. But by squaring it, so what I'm saying is that the correlation, if I look at the histogram of the correlations of Cij, the histogram of this will be, you know, if I remove the diagonal, will be more or less, not exactly, but the average will be zero. So it will be more or less balanced between plus and minus. The average definitely will be zero if I remove the diagonal, okay? So, but what happens is that as I increase at low temperatures, it is, <coughs> um, at low temperatures, it is, uh, as a narrow, the distribution is narrow, and as I approach T, it becomes broader and broader. In other words, the, the, the standard deviation of the distribution becomes broader and broader, and it diverges as I approach T. <coughs> so that kind of a glimpse behind this field, a glimpse at the correlation, how the mechanism for the, for the transition emerges by developing random correlations but nevertheless, the strength of the correlation is becoming stronger and stronger. Okay, questions up to now. Okay, so let's uh, take a break here, and after that, I'm going to tell you that the whole thing is wrong.
higher energy, so it means that, for instance, here I'll pick the one uh, at zero temperature, I'll pick the one with higher, not only flame, higher energy. How can it be that the physical state is the one with the higher energy or higher free energy? It doesn't make sense, right? This is your question. You want to develop your solution. Okay. The answer is that <laughs> when I say it's unstable, and unlike other mean field theory, it turns out this is simply not a physical, not a physical matter. It, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't correspond to a physical state. It's not like a thermomagnet that there is a paramagnetic state that it's higher energy or higher energy. No, it's nothing. It's not that there is a really state with lower energy or lower energy, and somehow we decide not to look at that. Simply, this is garbage, non-physical. Bottom line, don't don't be fooled by that. Ah, the last. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, we can continue. We finish with this, but uh, I think it'll be a lot. I think it'll be a lot, but it's our time. So we don't have to be. We don't have to determine my energy of the field. You're telling me that you you decree that the temperature will happen. So that it's not your bad math. In calling it. You make some confusion very effort, but the one one that met, she's there or let me mean some song. When I do this, I have an extra song, I never get a smart.
as before, this part, no, I'm sorry. Let me, let, let's leave it like this, okay? But now, now instead of JIJ has zero mean, JIJ has non zero mean, and I'll denote it by J0 over N. It, uh, I already had hinted that the, the mean part, the uniform part, has to be weak by 1 over N, and the fluctuations of the JIJ is, uh, is as before J square over N, the variance. So the variance is J square over N, the mean is J0 over N. And again, very important to notice that that for a single bond, the mean is much is weaker by a factor of one over square root of n than the typical bond, because this is one over square root of n, this is one over n. But because the uniform adds up uniformly, it gives something of order one, whereas the for the variance, because of cancellation, you have to make it stronger, and therefore this is the right, this is the right scale. Okay. Now you can put everything into the machinery of replica and look at the replica solution, the replica symmetric solution, and now compute what will be the phase diagram. So now I'm going to tell you how the phase diagram looks like. You have to derive it. So now we have two parameters. One parameter is J0 over J, the uniform versus the, the standard deviation. Another one is T over J. So this is temperature, and this is uniform. Okay, and I'm considering J0 bigger than J, J0 is, is less than J, nothing happens, nothing of interest happens. Um, and now we have the phase diagram like this, it's kind of more interesting than just the point. So now we have three phases. We have the power magnetic phase, so it is power magnetic, which means Q equal to zero, but also the uniform uh, magnetization, which I'll call M, also equal to zero. So that's the standard. <coughs> Here there is M not equal to zero, so it's plus minus. There are two solutions, but M not equal to zero. This is the ferromagnetic phase. This is just the diagonal. So there is a breakdown of the global symmetry. There is a long range order because M, by M I mean, by M I mean SI thermal average and also French average without without square. So this is M. Okay, and then here in <coughs> this, in this part there is a spinless transition, which is Q bigger than zero, but M. This is the phase diagram, and you, you will derive the equations and compute it. This point here is square root of pi over 2 gamma. Okay. okay, and that's very important phase diagram because it now there is kind of competition between a normal order, long range order, where everybody wants to be either up or down, and the disorder, which is the, the, J, the J and temperature. So this is the competition between thermal versus J and J0 versus J. So that's a very important um, kind of description of what the system is doing. Okay. One more point. Now suppose I add up a field, a uniform field, and I don't expand around zero, I just keep it non-zero. Add a field. But I'm not, here I'm just looking at the susceptibility is computed at at the limit h goes to zero, right? But now suppose just add a field and keep it fixed, whatever the value is. What happens to the transition? Is there a transition? There's no transition. Well,
But the answer is there is not one addition anymore. Well, I can, this is easy to prove here. You know, if you add a field, it will have linear symmetry beta times the field. And you can, you should prove it yourself, but that's simple. Just add this external field here. But once h is not zero, q equal to zero is, is not a solution. It's not a solution for any temperature. So then it doesn't matter. Ferromagnetic, the whole thing going down the drain. There is no transition. Small Q, large Q, but there is no sharp transition because there is always some SI in the system and other SI because of the H. Okay. Let's say uh, that. Uh, sorry, sorry, you have two solutions? No, no, no. Not two solutions, not a symmetry. Yeah. Then you have multiple solutions in this kind of always when it's nice. Well, you can have two solutions if H is sufficiently strong, zero temperature. You can have such a thing, but in that if you have J0 also and a field, you can have metastatic state state. You can have, but let's not worry about it now. But if you look at the at kind of the equilibrium state, it's unique, it's, uh, you know, there's no singularity involved and so on. You can have a metastatic state, state like in any ferromagnetic strong field or such, a strong magnetic field at low temperature, you can have kind of, you know, one very here and one very here. I don't want to discuss now because it's not interesting. Always we have such possibility. But uh, let's say J0 is 0, there is no thermomagnetic anything, then you don't have any two solutions, there is a unique solution. So this would be true also if you have a random field <coughs> instead of the symmetry. What? So this would be true also if you have a random field. This would be true also if you have a random HI. Yeah. If you have random HI and you have J0, you may break you may break the symmetry, the global symmetry sphere, the main sphere. But if there is no J0, if you just have J and, and a random field, again. Once you have something there, then SI average is non zero at all temperature. You can put here, so what, what uh, Johan is saying, you can put here HI and have some extra, extra integration average over this HI. Then again, Q equal to zero will not be a solution and, and, uh, and there is no transition. Okay, so at least not if there is, if there is no J0. That's an important point. So uh, Q, so this is H equal to zero, no transition, no transition uh, for H you know, non-zero, at least not with J zero. Uh, well, again, I don't want to talk about metastability. stability. Let's just, let's not to talk about metastability, stability, but the stable state when once H is not zero, Q is not zero, N is not zero, and, and, and that's it. <coughs> okay, good. <coughs> so, um, <coughs> Sherrington and Kirkpatrick, when they derived this fantastic solution with replica, uh, they immediately realized that something is wrong. There are two problems, two main problems with these solutions, with the with the RF solution, replica symmetric solution. I'm, I'm going to, by the way back to J0 is zero and H is zero, just in figures case, right? The simple pure finger. No field, no J0. <coughs> okay, two problems with that solution. One problem is you know, you can take these three energy, you know, there's a prediction about what J0 is, you can compute it, you can compare it to simulation, but, <coughs> but you can compute the entropy, you know, the first derivative of the three energy with respect to temperature, as we discussed in the first class, <coughs> and compute the entropy. And when you compute the entropy at zero temperature, you can take the limit to zero temperature, you get a negative answer. Problem number one. Entropy for a system with a finite number of states cannot be negative, right? can be zero, but not negative, because it's simply the log of the number, you know, average of the log of the probabilities, or zero temperature, the log of the number of states, whatever, it cannot be, it cannot be negative. If, if the variables are continuous, then we know that it can be negative. 
Now, if you go back and ask, well, you can say, well, maybe it's some low temperature effect. Something happens at night. Maybe, maybe there's another scale of temperature or something where there is an effect. But it turns out that if you can go back to the calculation and, and do the stability, you find it unstable. For all temperatures below J, it's unstable. <coughs> so remember, I told you here, that this is unstable, but this is stable. Now I'm saying also this is unstable. So let me justify what I say. I'm not going to do stability analysis. I'll tell you what I mean by that. So remember, we have this, we have this uh, integrals over the matrices Q alpha beta with n times n minus one degrees of freedom. You have, you have, you have a solution with some Q, which is the Q, this Q must be calculated, and now you set up the round. Right? But the perturbation, the fluctuation around this solution can be divided into two types. One is the same the perturbation, what's called longitudinal, the same structure, the same symmetry, you know, a matrix which all elements are Q, but just the Q is perturbed. So it's keeping the symmetry. If you do this, that's what you find, that this is unstable, but this is stable. <coughs> but now you can ask yourself, okay, what happens if I allow perturbation which are orthogonal to this symmetry, which develop of delta Q, you know, Q plus delta Q, this is the mean Q plus delta Q, that's fine. But if you now say Q alpha beta is our Q, which is uh, Q times 1 minus delta alpha beta, all of them are equal, plus some fluctuations delta Q alpha beta, but now the fluctuations are transverse which means that they are actually orthogonal to the uniform mode. They, the sum of them is zero. So what they want is to actually break the symmetry. If you look at these fluctuations, you find that this solution is unstable. Not only this, but also this is unstable. This is unstable to longitudinal fluctuations. This is unstable to transverse fluctuations. Okay. And this is, the, in other words, the problems are not only at zero temperature, problems are already as soon as there is something happening. So it turns out that above Pg, it's stable. For P, above Pg, Q equals to zero is the, is the solution, and uh, there is no other solution, and everything is fine. But below Pg, below J, this solution is unstable. And you can imagine what's, what's going on in the, in the, in the community of uh, statistical mechanics You know, there is uh, these equations, nice equations of Gaussian, cramped fields, very intuitive. There is a naive derivation, there's two arrows which cut each other, everything is fine. It turns out that after all, everything is not fine. <coughs> all right, so. Is this a mixture with Pg and J correct? Yes, as I said, it's, it, this, this is correct. This is correct, but what happens below it that there is a problem in stability. <coughs> so, now uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be very qualitative because I don't want to go into a very uh, elaborate uh, uh, theory, but <coughs> the bottom line is that the correct solution breaks the symmetry. It's not a good problem, obviously, because the, the perturbation wants to break the symmetry. So, and the solution uh, finally was given by Parisi, and it's called Parisi solution or RSD solution. RSD for replica symmetry broken, replica symmetry breaking. So now 
now we have to look at a different solution. And different solution then is a solution which does not obey the, the symmetry, but it has B, has breaking of the electric asymmetry. Now, of course, if the free energy has the symmetry that I said before, and the solution is breaking the symmetry, it must be that there are other solutions which are related to the symmetry. But we just pick one of them. Okay. Like in the thermomagnet, we have mv equals 0, and f is 0, we just pick one of them. OK, now, okay, so now what it means? It means that pure alpha beta it has the, doesn't have this nice structure. But it's crazy, right? Because if, if it doesn't have this nice structure, it means that the electrical one is different from electrical two. What is the physical? There's no, there's no sense physically. The those electricals were completely arbitrary. Just focus on the system. One question. Second question: If the symmetry is broken, then then how do you take the angles to zero? Right? If this is an arbitrary matrix with complicated structure, there is no clear way that you will have a way to take angles to zero. So it turns out that. Uh, the, the structure end, ends up, again, a bizarre structure, uh, which I can describe, or one can describe, only as a sequence of solutions, uh, which uh, at the limit, the limits of the sequence will give the right answer. Each, each element in this sequence is a solution of the seven point equation but it's not yet right. It's less unstable, but not yet right. We have to take the limit in order to get the true physical stable solution. But the only way to, to actually describe to you what it is, is by giving you the, the recipe of the sequence. And basically the sequence is kind of hierarchical. Okay? So, so I'll, I'll show you how, how it looks like. So we start with this solution. This solution has zero in the diagonal, and then has some Q here. I'll call this Q, Q0. Okay. <coughs> now, the next stage, I'm breaking the symmetry. And the way I'm breaking it, I'm assuming block structure. So I'm assuming that there is uh, here, let's take M, let's call it M1, a block, blocks of size M1. Outside the block, the main block, I put Q0. Inside, I put Q1, except for the diagonal, which is always 0. In other words, I take this matrix and put it as, as the main block. Yeah. And then the rest will be Q0. And I keep doing it. So now, I, but I stop now. Well, yeah, stop now. So now I'm I'm doing it here, and 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 saying M1 is a block where I put the whole thing into it. So now I have M1 has this structure that there is main blocks of size M2, which has Q2 and zero in the diagonal. So this is again Q2, Q2, Q2. I have Q1 outside, and I have the same structure here and here. And outside I have Q0. Is the vertical dot n small n equal to 1? It's still, the, the size is n. n is supposed to be big. m1 is a divider of n. And now M1, M1 is a divider of M2 and a divider of N, because everything is integer, right? So, and I can, I go on like this, okay? And each, 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 uh, each, um, each stage, I can call it the, the K stage. At each stage, I have N, which I call, uh, let's call it M, M0, just a location. And then M0 is big, not only big, but it's kind of, it's, uh, uh, it's bigger than M1, and M1 is bigger than M2, etc., up to Mk, which is uh, bigger than 1. So this is the K stage. And from, from, from this, and, and there are Q, Q0, Q1, Q2, da, 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 Qk. Right? Here I have Q0. 
Q1, here I see zero, Q1, Q2, etc., etc. Okay. And in order for this to be able to go on and on, I have to take n to infinity. What? Well, n goes to infinity, and it just, you know, all of these are divided, so it's kinematic. Something times n k m one something times it's kinematic and it's natural. Okay, it's like it, it in fact it doesn't really matter the details. Of it. I mean, for any finite n, you can do you can do you know three by three, six by six, nine by nine. It doesn't matter. It's the it's the kinematic structure which is natural. So we are not going to we are not going to keep neither this nor that because we take n goes to zero and the end. Okay, but nevertheless we have this structure. Okay, so. So we have infinite number of, of the parameters, an infinite number of these breakings, okay, of the, of, the, of the dimensionality. And then at the end, we take the end goes the end, the end goes to zero again. And we take it, and again I don't want to go into how we do it, we take it in such a way that this is now zero and this is one, so the, the inequalities are reversed. So now we have m0 and less than m1, less than m2, less than mk, etc. The inequality is reversed. So it, it, there is a recipe how to do it, and I, I don't have time and uh, no particular reason to go into the details. So n goes to zero limit, this inequality is reversed. Okay, fine. So let's let's see how can we take the limit to compute something. Okay, so let's 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 look at q for instance. Suppose I want to compute q. And because I want to convince you that there is a sense in which n goes to zero. So let's compute Q. What is Q? Q is the SI, the Edward Anderson Q, the SI average square. Okay. In the replica, this one is simply SI alpha, SI beta, average with the Hamiltonian of the replica, right? That's it. But because I break the symmetry, I have to choose which alpha beta. But the physical, all the parameter, you know, doesn't Now you can see that what happens is that you have one over n times n minus one, and now I have to let's say specificate. So now I have sum over a little k, and you can see I get m zero, which is n minus n one times q zero. Then I have m one minus n two q one. Then I have Now we 
are the, the measures. So uh, Vx is, is this. Vx is basically m, uh, you know, m, m i minus m i plus one, something like that, between zero and one, right? <coughs> Again, the details, I, I don't want to get into, but the flavor. function, an order function, qx, which is of course a function of temperature, but qx, so instead of having one order parameter q, we have an order function qx. But is the function or is the order function, or the Parisi, it's called the Parisi solution. <coughs> However, again, I don't want to get into the details of and convince you that this is the right thing to do, I want to give you rather the physical interpretation of that. Of, of beca before that, how QX looks like. You can now assume this, you can write equations for Q, for this function Q of X, and the solution in general has this, this form. If I look at the function, above, above PG, of course, nothing happens, Q is zero. Below it, zero, uh, almost linearly, not exactly linearly, but at some point it is Planckian. So let's call it x bar. x bar is now x1, where it's got x1, where it's Planckian. And then, and the value here is just q of 1. <coughs> so you see, this is what we had before. All the x's were the same. All the q of x were the same. part of the range of x has, has a non-trivial function, it's not the same. If everything was the same, we back into the epistemic solution. Because you can, you can assume the structure, but if all the q's are just one q, then it's just very easy to back into that. Okay. Um, what is the physical meaning? That's just important to, to uh, understand. Uh, let me give you, first of all, a, a clue moment of Q. And then let me, uh, let me explain to you what I mean by that. Of Q. What, what I mean by higher moment. Okay, so le let me define Q2. And let me define it the following. 1 over n square. So I can add the French average, but before that, sum over i and j of S i S j In the spin lab, there is 1 over n, okay? And it was in high temperature. At, at high temperature, the spin lab, this is 0, I mean, because of 1 over n squared. And, and the 1 over n is not 0, and this is the spin lab susceptibility. But now I'm having 1 over n squared, and I'm at low temperature. So it's not 0. But because the correlations are weak, you know, I can think about it as 
naively as 1 over m squared times sum over a s i and j s i s j and then square each one. I can decouple s i and j because the correlations are again weak. Uh, if I put 1 over m, I pick them, but without 1 over m, with 1 over m squared, the correlations are weak. I can just decouple them and I get this. But this is now the same as 1 over n times sum over i s i square over s square and then I can do others, right? Okay, so with this argument about the weakness of correlation, I just got q squared. Right? The leading term is just decoupling this, therefore I have this. This is basically, uh, you know, the, the self-averaging, this is just q. So let's, let's just write it q, and then q squared. If I am assuming self-averaging, this would be true. Right? The, is the algebra correct? I, I'm, there's a question about the algebra. But the assumption is... The assumption is that this sum, because I sum, mm -hmm. it is just I can write it as Q. Because I sum, it's this self-averaging, right? I, I specially average this guy. That would be the naive. If I take the replicate... will be S I S J will be what I wrote S I S J plus the covariance and the covariance is not order one it's order one with square root of n this is why when I have one over n square I can forget about the covariance the fluctuation I can decouple it so this here will have delta S I delta S J this <coughs> is not order one it's order one with square root of So what I'm expecting is that this one will just be Q squared. Okay, let's now turn on to the machinery of the Parisian solution. Let's now compute it. Well, what will be Q2? Q2 will be 1 over <coughs> n squared, sum over ij. There is no French average because I'm replicating, so I can write it as S i alpha S i beta times S j alpha S j beta. <coughs> right? That's, that's fine. But which alpha beta? Well, all of them are, are, are kosher, so I can write it as 1 over n times n minus 1, sum over alpha beta, all of them. Uh, alpha not equal to beta, right? And then I'll have um, uh, this, uh, you know, I'll have uh, sum of alpha beta, and then I'll have uh, 1 over n, sum over i goes from 1 to n, s i alpha, s i beta, and then whole thing square. The same argument about, about this, uh, about weakness of correlation. But now with the language of the replica. Again, I have alpha, I have two, I have twice SI alpha SJ alpha because they belong to the inside the thermal average, and I have beta SI beta, which is the, uh, the, the other factor or something. Okay. Now, this is simply Q alpha beta. Right? This is just Q alpha beta. If I compute it with, this, with the replica, I'll get here Q alpha beta. Okay, so we can write down, we can write down that <coughs> the Q2, this Q2, is on one hand side is 1 over n times n minus 1, sum over alpha not equal to beta of Q alpha beta squared. On the other hand side, if I take for the solution, I just get, again, dx from 0 to 1, except that I'll get here q squared of x. This is the same, the same thing, except that q here, all each one of these q will get squared. Because I have q alpha beta squared. So 
I get dx two squared. It's not it's not going to be equal to dx q of x squared. It's not going to be equal to that. So this this is this is wrong. It's going to be something else. Depending on the on, on this function. And and you can see that I can go to qk. I can define q k as uh, 1 over n to the power of k, <coughs> which is basically, you know, end up would be 1, of, one over n times sum over i, s i, all this uh, to the power, uh, I'm sorry, s i squared to the power of k. In, the, in this language, and in the replica language, it will be 1 over n times n minus 1 sum over alpha not equal to beta q alpha beta to the power k. And this will simply be dx q k of x. <coughs> okay. But this is interesting because it means that I can think about q as a random variable with a distribution. Because I can think about this as the moments of a random variable, and I compute the moments by, uh, by integrating dx. So this means that the way to think about this as, as the mo uh, you know, if I, call, if I call it q to the power k average, if I call this quantity q, then this is it. Then I can write it as dq, p of q, p goes from 0 to 1. And p of q is simply dx dt. So, so, so basically, we are going back to the self-averaging. If this was a self-averaging quantity, then it just gets q to the power k. But the fact that there is a non-trivial distribution of q means that this quantity is not self-average. OK, so where is this coming from? And the answer is, it's coming from the degeneracy of space. The of, uh, you can think about this ground state, ground state of the free energy of the, at, at finite temperature, or ground state of the of the uh, energy at zero temperature. So, so imagine that we have not one. We have this picture of Bellis, and we have not one state, but multi, many infinite number of states. Many, not infinite, but many. Let's denote them by L. L goes from 1 up to some big L, which is, is some power of N, whatever, N, N squared, N to the power. But it's kind of polynomial in N. So there are in infinite number of, of almost equal free energy. Actually, the delta, the FL minus the, the, the ground state the true, let's call it F0, is order 1. This is, this is, what, this is why we cannot, we cannot ignore them, because the difference in the free energy is not order n. So it's not a metastable state. I can forget about it. In other words, this is not, the, the, all of them have spectrum of free energy to order 1. Each one of them is order n, because they're extensive. This is not little f, this is big f. So each one of them is order n. They almost cancel each other, but not quite. So I have to take them into account. So let's imagine this is the picture. And now let's imagine I compute this. 1 over n times sum over i goes from 1 to n si. Well, what is this si? Si squared. This si, I have to, uh, there are many, many states. Okay, there is SIL, essentially. 
I can put you index, not replica index, but index of the state L. Each one of them will have some Q associated with it. If I compute the, the, the Q here, the Q here, the Q here, will be different. But moreover, I can I can not I can also ask not not only what is the Q of each one of the states, but also what is the overlap. So let's also define Q L L prime, which is the, defined as one over n times sum over i goes from one to n of S I L. So let me, let me put the L outside here, which is the L ground state times SI L prime, the L prime ground state. <coughs> it turns out that the Q that we computed is basically, um, yeah, is basically, so if I compute this QK in this language, you can see that this is basically sum over L and L prime of Q L and L prime times when I average I have to take into account the weight. The weight are the, the, the Gibbs weight. So P of L is E to the minus beta F L. So this is this is the quantities that I have to calculate. So the summation here over this uh, x or, or so this of q is coming from the fact that I have actually to compute quantities which are related to overlaps between and among multiple, many multiple degenerate states or almost degenerate states. And, and furthermore, One moment. If you look at what P of Q is in this language, it is easy to see that P of Q is sum over L and L prime of P of L times P of L prime times delta of Q minus Q of L L prime. <coughs> so when we say that Q is a, is a function Q of X or rather a distribution Q of Q, what are these different Q mean? The different Q this Q is now the possible overlaps between states. This summation is delta of Q minus Q L L prime. So P of Q is this. If I if I replace this by if I replace if I if I break this P of Q into two sums, one sum is sum over state itself. Then it will be P L square times <coughs> delta of Q minus Q L L. This is the this is the self overlap, the amount of freezing in the well L plus sum over L not equal to L prime, which is the overlap between different average overlap between different. turns out that if I look at Q of Q, remember Q of Q has this structure that um, Q of X looks like that. There is a plateau and something which goes to zero. This is X and this is 1 and this is X1. And this is Q. If you, if you go to P of X, P of Q, which is the derivative of dx dq, this will give you a delta function. So this will be 1 minus x1 times delta of q minus this q, this plateau value, q1, plus some, plus some function, f of q, which is, the, which is the continuous part, the smooth part. It turns out this is exactly this. Compare the two. The self overlap is exactly this plateau part. 
In other words, 1 minus x1 is the sum of the square of all the weights. So remember, sum over L, PL, of course, must be 1. But 1 minus x1 is sum over L, PL squared, which is less than 1, but it's not 0. So this is 1 minus x1. And q1 is the average overlap, self-overlap, the average freezing of each one of the of the, of the web. And then there is the other, the smooth part, which is the spectrum of overlap between different webs. So again, p of q starts with this sum. I break this sum into two terms. This is the self-overlap. This is the overlap between different wells. And one can show, I, again, I'm, 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 I'm not proving, but I'm saying that this part is exactly correspond to this delta. So Q1 <coughs> is the maximum of the Qs, which is the overlap within each one of the wells, which is this Q1. And the other Qs are the overlap between pairs of and the fact that it goes to zero means that there are wells, states, ground states, which are almost the same in energy, because otherwise their weight would be zero, but they have zero overlap, because their Q goes to zero. So we have a picture of a degeneracy of, of ground states, or ground free energy states, or, or ground states in energy at low temperature. And this, the, the correct description of the system has to do with, <coughs> with their weight, which is this PL, and the overlap between them, which is the spectrum of overlap, which is the different Qs, which are represented by this range of Qs going from 0 to 1. 1 is, a Q1 is the overlap of each state. then I should take Q1, <coughs> right? This is the, the freezing within each one of these ground states. But I cannot compute Q1 without computing the whole function. In other words, without really computing how the overlap between the states behave, which is this spectrum given by this distribution, the continuous part of this distribution of Q of Q. It turns out that there is no, uh, at least within the replica, and it turns out that not only within the replica, there is no easy way to compute Q1, to, to, to calculate a theory for Q1 without calculating the theory for the entire thing. This is why we have to go into this Q of X, not only per the rat about the system, but in order to compute Q1, we have to compute the entire function. That, that's, at least within the replica, that's the way it goes. Okay? But we are lucky in a way because by forcing ourselves to think about the entire function, we unmask a beautiful structure of the spectrum of ground state in the system. So there are multiple states, each one of them is more or less the same, all the ones different in energy, the, the freezing within each one of the web is more or less the same, but there is a spectrum of overlap. In other words, if you think about the state space, some of them are close, some of them are far, some of them are so far that the overlap between them is zero. 
or will be almost the same as an image. It turns out even more that because of the hierarchical structure of that uh, replica, which looks still the exact same thing, and that's a zero, it really reflects a hierarchical structure of the ground. You can, you can, you can go to the theory and show that the states are actually organized in a tree. In other words, values within values within values. You can prove it from the theory that, the, that those states which I can write it in one dimension, the really the way to think about it is at least in two dimensions, when I have states here, many states here, this is one value, 